right? And Matt Gunlock. Uh, Gunlock or Gunlock? I think it's Gunlock, right? Gunlock. Gunlock? Yeah. Well, I'm, sure, you... I'm, I'm sure the true German pronunciation is Gundelock or some shit like that. Don't try to but... church it up because you're a gun guy. <laughs> That's all it is. It's branding. All right. Always. So you're back on the show, and like I was saying, Ajax True Blood, which is a super cool name. What's the background on the True Blood? So Ajax is a is a call sign. True Blood, though, is an old English name crossed over um, into North Carolina, Elizabeth City. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Have you have you done like the research on the lineage of that and everything? Some of it, yeah. 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 So if you go to Elizabeth City today and go down, you'll see True Blood Hardware and True Blood, what is it, you know kind of weird for us because we don't see a lot of true bloods usually no i mean that's a super unique name i don't that's why i mentioned it there so what we're going to do here is i normally don't have two guests on because it especially on skype I, i'll do it in person but normally on skype i don't because we kind of step on each other and stuff and but i thought it would be interesting to have you guys both on i know we talked before this about matt's matt's deployment to with three two to iraq and in 2007 and then you can um, five excuse me 2005 god I got my notes right there too. I have it wrote down right there. And Ajax, though, a former Air Force officer, you decided to undertake this project to do like research and like the history of this whole, you know, deployment and stuff like that. You did interviews with the commanding officer, with people that were there, you know, all this stuff. So I thought it would be really interesting to have you guys both on and give a lot more context to the, to that deployment, and and we could talk. Were you detail, able so. to? Were you able to read it at all? I did read some of your. Uh, I did read some of the uh, the excerpt. Well, it wasn't an excerpt. I think it was the full, full yep. text that you might have sent me. So I did start reading that. I definitely did not read it all. It was like five hundred pages. Of yeah, I know so. it's too hard to get through. <laughs> How long did it take you to put that together? Uh, I've been working on it for almost five years, and it's about to come out. So how, how many years of that was compiling like interviews with, you know, members of three two. Oh, that's the, no, that that's about the process. So over 200, at least 200 interviews. Oh, maybe, OK. Maybe 300. But um, a lot of them were uh, all almost all on the phone and then uh, sometimes chats, long, extensive <laughs> chats. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so th the reason I asked, I guess, like that was because I was thinking maybe you did like three years of interviews and like two years of writing or something like that. So you were doing interviews as you were writing. Yeah, it's all intertwined, all intertwined. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of advice would you have for somebody that plans on writing like a military history book? And, you know, cause there's a lot of guys that want to write a book about their experience, but they don't really have an idea of how to get started in that. Um, wow. So start early to find a publisher. That's one, yeah. of, my big, one of the things I did not do. Um, so get your first like three or four chapters, two or three chapters that you think are, you know, well polished and start sending it out and trying to let you find an agent or a publisher. So don't wait till the end till you've got, you know, that's what I thought. Hey, I have to have the whole book done mm. before I get anybody interested, but I don't think that's really the way to do it. Yeah. I guess I would have assumed the same thing, but I guess it makes sense what you're saying. Like get a couple of chapters pretty cleaned up at like 80% or something like that, or 90%, yeah. send them out and let see what kind of interest it draws. Right. Right. And just start. I mean, that's like a parallel path, you know, start the professional path, you know, finding how how am I going to get this book published mm -hmm. um, or uh, or you can go with an agent. I couldn't really find an agent. So, yeah, yeah being a first time writer is like, yeah, nobody even answers you. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. For sure. It's like everything else. Or like, of course, you're a writer. Of course you are. And so yeah. they want to they want to work with someone that has a little bit of a right. You know, right. pedigree. They're, they're investing. Something. They're investing, sure. too. So uh, that's one thing. I don't know. Uh, probably map out the uh, okay. Here's where I'm going with this. You know, kind of kind of an outline. Yeah. But uh, I I don't know. I've made so many mistakes. I'm not sure I have really good advice. Just keep going. That's well. That's my, I mean that's part of it, right? Away. That's yeah, part of absolutely. it. The mistakes are part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I so know with creating anything, even like this podcast, I made a, a ton of mistakes. I continue to make mistakes, yeah. but you yeah. know, it, you, like you said, just keep going. And then I think you learn along the way and yeah. So really, yeah, really interested in looking more into it. Um, but let's, let's switch over here to Matt. You know, before you came on, we, we focused basically on your entire time with the Marine shooting team, Marine Corps shooting team 
and just kind of different aspects of competition shooting and stuff like that. But I want to have you come back on to talk about, you know, the rest of your career and kind of what led you up to that and your experience with the infantry and stuff. So, you know, you mentioned before we started that you, you got to three, two, not long before they deployed. And that was kind of at the beginning of your career. What was going on before that? You know, were there any highlights that you want to touch on before we get into your time at three, two? So, uh, I I guess starting it out, you know, I, I went to Security Force, so Security Force Europe and Fast Company. Um, and, you know, I did that for my f- first two years of my career, you know, going through the Straits of Bra- Straits of Gibraltar, going through the Suez Canal, do, you know, going to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which I happened to be in Cuba at the same time that 32 Mike Company was there. But, you know, nothing, nothing kinetic. You know, one thing I will say that was beneficial from going through security forces is we got a lot of train on cqb you know urban skills training stuff like that so that was paramount to everything that we did in iraq back in 2005 because the majority of that entire deployment was house to house clearing so in december of 2004 i left uh left first fast company went uh i was supposed to get orders to second battalion eighth marines and then whenever i was checking in at uh you know ipac or whatever it is there at camp lejeune they said hey your orders change you're going to third battalion second marines okay you know no i didn't think anything of it get to three two and find out hey in about three weeks you're deploying to iraq good to go that's a shocker I mean, right uh, i mean honestly it's kind of it's what all of us wanted. Like a lot of us that were in like fast company or even security forces Europe, we wanted to get out of that duty station to get over there, uh, get in the fight. You know, I was, I was in Jordan back in, you know, March 19th of 2003 when the war kicked off and I was on a ship and on, in Aqaba, you know, just guarding, uh, you know, a USNS vessel. And it's like the war kicks off and here you are, you're on a ship and, and there's nothing you could do. You know, the first sergeant told us, hey, you guys got to finish out your time in security forces and you can get over there. Well, you know, that was another almost two years. Yeah. You the know, it's not going to be going on that long. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I get to three, two, you know, Rainey, uh, Eric Rainey. He was my he ended up becoming my team leader. He had just got in there at the same time. And then Larry Philippon, uh, both of them came from eighth and I, and, uh, he was the other team leader and we had, shoot, we were a small platoon, you know, each, we, every squad was only a, uh, two team had two teams in each squad. So, you know, by TO standards, you're missing a whole team from each squad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, our squad leader at the time was, uh, Corporal Chris Borch, you know, uh, so it was a matter of, kind of getting to know everybody one cool aspect was whenever i got there i had uh kern and uh lockwood you know both those two guys and i we were we were in boot camp together so it's like holy shit oh nice so uh, it was really uh it, it was really good to uh come to a platoon where i already knew a couple of the guys that were there what rank were you when you got there lance corporal still the lance corporal huh yeah <laughs> yeah so you're you're getting ready to deploy in three weeks. What kind of preparation did you do? I mean, there obviously you, there's not a much lot of time for you. And those last couple of weeks, people are kind of winding down their training and prepping like the at home stuff. You know, making sure the wills are signed, making sure the all that yep. stuff's going on. So what kind of training did you get before you left? Um, we did some very, I would say, some very basic like CQB type training right there in the quad. Uh, mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing major. It was more like the the unit had just gotten back from 29 Palms, uh, you know, just done getting done with uh, what is it, ITX or whatever they called it back at the time. Yeah. CACs, CACs. So, um, you know, there wasn't really a whole lot to do at that point. Did. And, um, hmm? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. And originally, you know, I, I was just going to be like I wasn't going to be point man. I was going to be like the assistant automatic rifleman and. Uh, but then get over to country, you know, I take over the the 249 saw, which like one of the guys, he was a team leader. He got busted down, got in trouble. Um, but he had a lot of knowledge when it came to, um, when it came to being a team leader. Mm -hmm. So they kind of made him as the advisory team leader for Corporal Rainey. 
since he had just came from eighth and I, and I was like, Hey, I'll take the saw. I know what I'm doing with it. So that became my weapon. I loved it. Nice. Uh, f- for you, Ajax did, did Colonel Mundy, that's the CEO's name. I want to make sure I got Correct. it right. Yeah. Correct. Tim, okay, Colonel yep. Tim Mundy. Did he, did he talk to you any about what his thoughts were before the deployment and like what he thought the unit was about to get into? Um, we haven't gotten into that in person, but I've read there, uh, a lot of his, you know, published interviews. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, uh, were a little, the, the leadership of the battalion was a little, uh, um, dissatisfied with the training, uh, particularly the Sasso training that they received. Uh, I think it was 10 days in, uh, that March air reserve base. You remember that Matt? I wasn't there. Okay. What's a um, what's a Sasso training? Uh, stability, stability and, and support, support operations. Uh, it's it's uh, the modern the modern term for coin for counterinsurgency. Although it's kind of it's kind of multifaceted. Um, so they had role players. There was a it was an old housing unit, and but most of the training was focused on the stability side, like as if you were going to go into a, an area that had a functioning government that wasn't, wasn't super kinetic. Mm. Uh, a lot of kind of, uh, um, civil affairs type aspects. So that, uh, Colonel Mundy and his staff felt like they, cause they knew they were going into far West on bar to replace a one seven. And they knew they were, he calls it, they knew they were in a real dogfight. So they, they knew where they were going into a hot area and they just didn't feel like they were getting um, that, that the kind of training they, they needed. So he has expressed that. Um, yeah. It's, it's one of those things too, where like once you're in the, the PTP, you know, that pre pre-deployment training cycle, you have to go through whatever the big machine has created and get checks in the box for the task that they've right. assigned. And that may not, it may not reflect what you're actually going to do in country, which is unfortunate, especially for something like that, where you think you're going to go in and, you know, help fix sewer systems or something. And now you're going to right. do an actual, like legit combat operation. If you, if you recall the, uh, the Marine Corps was really big at first in the, during the Iraq war was really big in the, you know, no, bre- no better friend, no worse enemy on the no better friend part. Um, uh, they, talked about you know, a lot of units grew mustaches to fit in better, uh, to relate better with the men. There were uh, a lot of just focus on, you know, basically dealing with civilians. Yeah. The one thing that the, the three, two did, uh, cause Matt mentioned machine guns. One of their training areas of focus was machine gunnery and getting them every Marine a machine gunner was one of the things they were talking about. So they put a lot of emphasis on that. Colonel Mundy put a lot of emphasis on all his small unit leaders. Basically he knew it was going to be a small unit fight. Yeah. I think we've done a really well, a really good job of pushing that down to the small unit leaders within the Marine Corps. You know, when it's out, these guys are out on and combat outposts and stuff like that. Just kind of making things happen without senior leaders standing around or make you right. know, supervising. I think they do a really good job of that. Matt, when you got over there, like what, what, what did it feel like when you first got there? What was the kind of tone, you know, how did one seven, you know, how did the turnover with one seven go? Um, so let, what, let me... what, what I can remember, I guess, is whenever we got over there, you know, we were all anxious. We were all ready to get, get ready to do stuff. Um, I want to say one seven was, it seemed like they were ready to leave. Uh, oh, yeah, they had been, they, well, they were, they had gone through the ringer that entire deployment from what I recall. Um, but you know, a lot of the, a lot of the turnover from what I remember was a, 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 at the senior level, not, not as much during the, the, with the lower level leaders. Really? Let me, uh, okay. let me jump in on this, and provide yeah, some ahead. context. So, uh, s- such as, Many battalions experienced this. It was a decentralized fight. So 3-2 gets assigned to what was called Camp al Qaim. But before they even get there, one of their companies is stripped away. 
uh, Lima company was stripped away to to uh, do security duty at Al Assad to their great chagrin. So there's you know one third of their rifle companies gone. Uh, then India Company was sent to Huseva on the very edge, a place called Camp Gannon. So on the right on the border with Syria. So that was a key piece of terrain. It's where the border crossing was, the, the customs, and um, they had to occupy that spot. So there's another, they weren't really out of the fight. They had plenty of fight there, but uh, they're another company out. So now you have one company, one infantry, you know, rifle company left, and that's Kilo Company, and that's Matt's company. So Kilo Company was the, really the maneuver force, along with the weapons company, uh, call sign War Pig. And those were the two, you know. We were the main effort, essentially. The, the main, well, the, the, everybody wants to say the main effort. Well, I <laughs> mean, well, if but, you look at it. But they were the, definitely the maneuver force. And they were right. the ones that would roam all through the, the battalion AO and get pulled out to support their, let's call them the sister battalion, 325, a reserve battalion based in Haditha at the Haditha Dam. So Matt did probably several uh, operations down in Haditha, uh, along, not alongside necessarily, but in conjunction with 325. So you had basically the, the two engaged infantry companies, India at Huseba, Kilo at, at Camp AQ that was roaming all over the battle space and you know obviously supported and some Sometimes they were doing independent operation, the weapons company with their uh, mobile assault platoons, the maps. And this was, so you guys were covering down on what was being covered down on in a full battalion, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys were stretched way thin, yep. I would Correct. imagine. So how, I mean, that's crazy because this is a pretty, pretty violent Large. time in Iraq, you know, for, for them to like thin out a battalion in such a volatile area, you know, what, do you know what led to that kind of decision being made to do that? And well, let me, uh, let me weigh in on that. So if you recall, yeah, you know, 2004 up until Fallujah, there was a huge emphasis on hunting down the, re the remnant of Saddam's, cronies, the deck of cards and everything. So Baghdad was the focus. Then Fallujah mm -hmm. erupts. The Marines, you know, they have first Fallujah in April of 04, and then second Fallujah, the big one, uh, in November of 04. And that basically soaked up every, you know, all attention, planning, resources, uh, Marines were pulled from other parts of Anbar to to go into Fallujah or be supporting parts. So early 2005, they still haven't really recovered as far as institutionally, the coalition hadn't quite recovered. And it wasn't really thinking very much about what was going on in, in the, out in the desert in far west Anbar. Uh, they were still kind of ginning up. So 3-2 comes in as part of the second uh, regimental combat team, RCT-2. Uh, and they were an economy of force operation, absolutely. Yeah, man. That's a, what, a, what a place to be, right? And this is – were you guys still feeling effects from fighters that flew – or fleet that, I guess, flew from – uh Fallujah that you know flee when the Americans came in for the second battle honestly you know being that long ago I'm not entirely sure yeah. we just knew we were we were we just knew we were going to be getting into the fight and mm. and quite honestly like a lot of us were hungry for it you know none of us had, there's only been a few at that point in time that had really been you know battle tested um and you know we were just trying to get our feet wet at that point what were the atmospherics when you when you got on the ground? You know, what? How did the uh, local populace like receive you guys and stuff? Did you feel like they were like so, happy that you were there, or indifferent, or angry, or what? So a lot of our first uh, missions, you know, that we went on were just kind of small, you know, raids. I would say, you know, we would go to the cement factory and we did a raid on that. 
um, really didn't inter- interact with the population. I uh, remember the first night patrol I went on, you know, five minutes into the night patrol, my NVG stopped working nice. and, you know, there were old PVS seven Bravos, uh, you know, so just having to go, you know, with naked eyes and we really didn't, we didn't, it was more of a training mission, uh, that was a real mission, but we were just kind of going out there to get prepared. Uh, the first real major operation we went on was uh, was down in Haditha, uh, and our platoon was operating out of Haklania. Um And for the I most think, part... I think that was Operation Outer Banks. It was. Yeah, that, that's what I was trying to think of, Operation Outer Banks. And, and quite honestly, like... For the most part, the population was it. They were fine with us. We really didn't meet a whole lot of resistance every now and again. Pop shots, RPGs, uh, but no big, serious firefights. You know, there were you knew whenever I I guess basically, you know, whenever the city was empty, there was going to be a problem. Whenever people were roaming around, walking around, you knew you knew that a fight was coming. Yeah. Now, after you guys had been on the ground for a little bit, did it feel like you were getting into like a rhythm or did it like, like, oh, we know if we go over here at this time that we're going to get shot at, or if we go over this spot at the, you know, or was it something that was constantly evolving as, as the deployment went on? I would say it kind of just constantly evolved because like the biggest thing there, I want to say three, two participated in five major clearing operations. So there weren't really any patrols like in 2007, eight, nine timeframe mm-hmm. where you were like doing court and non census patrols, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you were around the population at all times. Our deployment was straight, just clearing operations. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me right. let me throw in another little pieces of the chronology. So they they arrive in late February. Um, Mar- most of March is the process that Matt's describing the the you know the rip the two week you know left seat right seat then then graduating and getting more aggressive out into the out into the AO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think soon, probably in March, I can't remember if, if it was at the end of March or in the beginning of April, that's when Outer Banks happened, where they, they went over to Haditha to support the, so the 3 it was, effort. Yeah, Outer Banks was a week before, Outer Banks ended a week before Matador began. Okay, that's correct. Yeah, that's right. So that was, uh, yeah. It was already, the end of oh, April. End of April, that's right. So, but one thing that did happen early on in March, well, about halfway through March, March 21st, uh, I'm, I've mentioned um, the uh, well. It wasn't it wasn't War Pig. It was actually the security platoon call sign Chaos, and they were uh, at a at a uh, vehicle checkpoint when they were hit with a suicide bomber, uh, which killed one of the the vehicle commanders. So that was the first uh, KIA that the battalion suffered, and it kind of came out of the blue. It's kind of like, I don't know if Matt recalls this or, or how, what the emotional impact of that being in a whole different unit. But um, I know that the staff was like, oh, crap. Because it was, it was also obvious in that instance that they were targeted, that mm-hmm. there was somebody watching and somebody uh, deliberately waited until they were starting to break down and then sent in the suicide bomber. Uh, so that was, that was- Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. Yep, he was killed in action. Yep. And a lot of those guys from the security platoon, like, after that incident, well, well, it wasn't right after that incident. I would say it was right after Matador uh, finished up. Uh, They broke up security platoon. And then a lot of those, quite a few of those guys came over to second platoon because we had a whole team that went down, uh, who who got taken down, uh, what four wounded in action one uh, killed in action and so we need people um specifically the team uh the 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 team in my squad we needed people and like our squad took the majority of the people and you know those were those were kevin smith's closest friends so that's when it really hit us because we had just we had just taken you know philippon got killed Kevin Smith was killed and you had two, you know, two guys or a bunch of guys from, uh, essentially like they connected on a whole deeper level. 
Yeah. There's another another big incident that happens uh, on April 11th. So uh, that's up at, at Camp Gannon, which is this uh, satellite uh, firm base right on the border where India Company is uh, and some some uh, supporting elements. So on April 11th, a triple suicide bomber attack happens uh, in the morning, and it's it's a complex attack. It's pretty sophisticated, and it was clearly an effort to break through the perimeter and kill as many Marines as they could. Uh, and it's one of the most famous. You've, you've probably seen it. There's, uh, there's the video still out there on the web with uh, you know the jihadis doing their you know propaganda thing about it, where they're these massive explosions and. Uh, but that was the day that uh, they thought at first that, you know, many dozens of Marines had been killed. But it turned out that they did not penetrate and everybody survived. But that sure was another wake up call to the entire battalion that there was an enemy there that was savvy, that was ready to engage them and had, you know, Deadly intent at, at every. I mean, turn. multiple suicide bomber attacks. That's crazy, you know. Three. There were three consecutive. Two of them. One of the last two were a. Uh, well, this is all within minutes of each other. Yeah. Um, a, a huge dump truck, followed by a fire truck. The the infamous fire truck that they had been hearing about that had been roaming the battle space, as apparently, but they couldn't. No one could find where it was, uh, and that it appeared on April 11th and tried to penetrate. I feel like I interviewed someone else that was talking about the same incident, the one like the dump truck that went off. He was a machine gunner, I believe, or an assault man. I can't remember. But man, was that an ongoing thing? Were there more suicide attacks? The suicide yes. bomber thing, the suicide bomber thing just blows my mind. The fact that they can find that many people to like, yeah, yeah let's do there, this. There, that was essentially their heavy weapon. Their, their precision heavy weapon. This is now what, what's not, what wasn't clear at, First, I don't think Matt would have known uh, that that they were engaging Al Qaeda in Iraq, which later obviously turns into ISIS. So this was the the Zarqawi-led foreign fighter-led organization that was morphing into what was called Al Qaeda in Iraq, and they were funneling fight, foreign fighters across the border fr from Syria, but they were coming from all over. There were Chechens, there were Sudanese, there were probably some Europeans. Uh, but anybody who wanted to get their jihad on was coming through Syria, coming right through uh, the area of operations that 3-2 controlled. And they were setting up that rat line to file, to, to uh, stage and then pass on these fighters, the foreign fighters and suicide bombers, all the way into Baghdad. So... There were training things set up. There were uh, reception areas set up. Obviously, lots of arms caches and and um, SVBID factories or mm -hmm. shops. You know, I don't know how big it is before it becomes a factory, but they found shops of of vehicles that were, you know, several vehicles where they would put the the uh, explosives. Training rooms. So all of this was part of Al Qaeda in Iraq's effort to build this rat line. And also they intended to declare their caliphate in the district of Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. so it's just, it, it, again, it's just so mind blowing that they can find so many people willing to blow themselves up where you are like, you have a, a dedicated team to make these suicide, you know, vehicle born IEDs and these right. suicide vests for people running around and the other problem is too, like, because they can do that, because they have people that are willing to do that, it's hard to counter it because anyone can be, anyone could be a target yeah. or anyone could be the, the person carrying a vest. You don't know, uh, any vehicle, you know, you start having to look, did you guys, did you ever encounter any that you guys found before they set them off, Matt? Like any, like, Oh, we saw yeah. the signs, the vehicle was riding low or anything like that. Uh, no. Uh, during that deployment, no, but we did find, we did attack one of their ID making compounds mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it was, it was kind of funny after you think about it, but it's like, we, we hit this compound, one of the first buildings we hit, you know, me, uh, me, Lance Gale and Lockwood 
we take cover. Rainey's about to throw his grenade in. Then when we're taking cover, you know, we see the full effect that it's just an open-ended garage, and he's just throwing, uh, he's throwing a grenade into a garage full of cars. That's, you know, you could see all the cars, and we're like, "Don't throw the grenade! Don't throw the grenade! There's a bunch of cars there!" And he's like, "I already pulled the pin. Fuck it, just throw the grenade then." He throws a grenade. He runs to cover and everything. And we were just expecting to get explosions, like, you know, secondary explosions. Mm -hmm. Turns out that those were SV bids being prepared to go out, you know. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, luckily, nothing went off. But, you know, that was one of the main objectives uh, of Operation Spear. Um, and in that same compound, we found four hostages. Um, you know, me, Rainey, Gail, and Lockwood stacked up on a door threw a grenade in immediately went in got choked up but from all the smoke and then we hear voices on the other side of the door we we're like holy shit there's people on the other side um and we kick that door open and there's four guys handcuffed and everything or just tied up right in front of a stairwell and you know they were what uh, they were police officers and, and, and whatnot. One of them was a uh, what a young kid, from what I can recall. Um, it's detailed more in in Ajax's book. But what, what are they gonna like? What do they have them for? You know, one of their one of their head chopping videos or what? I mean, well, let me you know what they were. Gonna yeah, do let me them? try to give some more background. Um, one of the and the, this is a big reason why I picked three two as the subject. This. Uh, the tribes, the Sunni tribes in Western Iraq, uh, first off, they were never very well controlled by the central government. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the beginning of the war, they, you know, basically saw the, the coalition, the U.S. as invaders and were part of the insurgency, pushing against, you know, you know doing attacks. Um, and they were definitely part of the enemy. But at a certain point, starting in 2004 and into 2005, some of these tribes started to push back against the foreign fighters, which were absolutely insane, you know, and, and would would intimidate, would murder, would torture uh, to keep the tribes in line. And if any tribe would would try to exercise their own autonomy or or independence from this this foreign fighter group, uh, they would, they would attack them. So they kind of, you know, kept the, the locals in check. But by 2005, when three, two arrives, one tribe in particular was called the Albu Mahal out in the far West and around Huseba and some of these cities that, that Matt is talking about starts to really part ways violently with, like terrorists and they have this internecine fight between the everyone called it red on red between the tribals and the aqi fighters and they had their own tribal allies too so there was tribe versus tribe so for the a lot of the marines they didn't really realize what was going on and kilo company to be honest didn't really engage in that uh that's where india company comes into the story um so you had these foreign fighters that were kidnapping people uh, and, you know, holding them hostage, torturing, killing. And that's what mattered. Cutting heads off. Cutting heads off. That was quite common. They would roll up on pretty gruesome scenes uh, at crossroads where uh, there's a couple of incidents I mentioned in the book. One where uh, they find a whole family, you know, with their heads cut off and put on their chests. Yeah, yeah that, was Chapin, up, that was Chapin. That uh, was Chapin. Chapin Pullman and uh, uh, Rooksy. Yep. Rooksy uh, had to go pick those bodies up because we, you know, our platoon got tasked and that specific squad got tasked with going and picking up these dead bodies. Man. So, so you That's have tough. this it's essentially like a three way war. You have. You know, one tribe that's trying to fight against AQI and they're having their own, you know, intertribal fight. Then you have the Marines fighting against AQI uh, and trying to figure out 
who's neutral, who's, you know, on the same side is mm -hmm. very difficult through most of the deployment towards the end. They kind of, everyone kind of figures it out, but, um, that's a, that's a big part of the story, but, uh, chr chronologically, let me just kind of bring it up to where Matt, I think is going to, you know, star here is that, uh, in May of 2005, uh, so the battalion had been on the ground for what, two and a half months. Okay. Uh, so this was their first big operation. It was called Operation Matador. And it was to go on the on the northern side of the Euphrates. In that area, the Euphrates runs basically east and west. And uh, nobody had been north of the Euphrates. Right. And period. Like special operations was really interested in that area. They did some hard hits, targeted hits. But nobody really had been in that northern area at all. It was called uh, Romana, and uh, yeah, it had been untouched by by conventional forces. Special or the uh, the soft guys had found targets there, but it was basically a, a safe haven. Uh, and so Operation Matador was conceived partly to go, well, hey, we have to, we've got these suicide bombers running around. They're probably coming from that area, so we're gonna we're gonna cross the river. Uh, and and I guess I guess fast forwarding a couple of days into the operations, you going back to your question of the atmospherics and, and and the people in the area. I I recall like we went up to some people and we were trying to get information on you know, hey, where are the bad guys? You know, where's the insurgents at? You know, mm -hmm. trying to get that information and none of them wanted to say a word to us. They say we talk to you, we we die like that and. And those foreign insurgents had such a stranglehold on the local population that if anybody had talked to us, they would be murdered. And yeah. we went up, we, we saw many scenes where, you know, shoot, I remember, you know, our corpsmen were treating, you know, burn victims and stuff like that, like from IEDs and, and other incidents, like just like had to have been like a five year old kid, you know, just completely burned from head to toe, you know, just some of the most fucked up shit you would ever see. Yeah, man. I mean, damn, that's, uh, that's what, that's what happens when you deal with psychos, you know? And I think that's what they, obviously people saw that more. It became more public when it was like ISIS out there putting out those like high quality, high production murder videos, you know? And I, mm -hmm. people started to realize like, Oh shit, these people are crazy, but that's something that was there the entire time. That wasn't something that had just popped up, you know, once ISIS became a big deal, that was something that was in Iraq and, and other places. I don't know, man, when, when you were going through and doing, what's it like to walk into like a, a building, you know, they're building these suicide bomb, like vest, you know, there's gotta be like a weird feeling kind of being in that kind of environment. So honestly, whenever we hit that compound, me personally, I didn't know it was like an SV bid, you know, factory, mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't until after the fact, you know, and, and quite honestly, we knew that they, they were around, but realistically it was, let's get to the next target. Let's get to the next target. Like just let's clear one building after the other. You didn't think about those things. And one of the cool aspects of that deployment is we were working with the ISF, the Iraqi security forces. And honestly, from what they told us, we were the first, you know, we were the first unit to really embrace them and use them for what they were. Um, and we used them first in Operation Outer Banks. They were not with us for Operation Matador. They were out supporting something else. But whenever we went out on Operation Spear, we got the same squad that we worked with uh, from Outer Banks out on Operation Spear. And it was it was a really cool experience just being able to you you we built a partnership with them in operation uh outer banks and then whenever we saw them in, again in spear it just like kind of solidified that relationship that we built and those guys were so hungry like they wanted to be the first ones to kick doors down if 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 they thought you were kicking more doors down than them they would go parallel block and just start kicking doors down themselves and they saved us in a pinch many times like they they pointed out like where ieds were they they knew what to look for um that's like, what I, that's locals, what I was you, want, you want to you want to talk about warriors those guys were fucking warriors they were that's good what, that's what i was gonna say is that uh whenever the iraqis worked with the marines uh 
it magnified their effectiveness because the Iraqis knew where to look for stuff. They knew mm -hmm. where things were hidden. They knew how to find the caches. They knew how to find the hidden weapons. Uh, were these operations, you know, as as you had one after another, you had, you know, Matador, Spear, all these, were they, was one operation setting the, you know, setting the the uh, conditions for the next operation or was each one and like individual objectives because something popped up or, you know, how, how well, did, how did those operations come about? Let me, uh, yeah. The, the RCT commander, Colonel Stephen Davis, uh, had a whole plan. Uh, so th he's based out of, uh, Al Assad air base. Uh, but he's controlling that whole AO Denver, the far West on bar from Haditha, roughly, uh, so not not Ramadi, but Haditha out out to the border, and he knows he doesn't have enough enough, particularly infantry companies. He doesn't have enough, so he's basically just hitting and moving, just trying to keep the uh, keep the insurgents off balance. And they would do an operation in Haditha, then they then they'd move somewhere else, and they'd hit the Al Qaim area. So they were constantly moving things around the 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 battle space to. Uh, Kind of be everywhere but nowhere was his little catchphrase. So uh, th there were it wasn't a rolling sequence. It was in their mind it made sense. At the staff, the regimental staff mind, it made sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't. It didn't just start at the you know east and roll west. It was hopscotching around. Yep, and that's what I remember. Like first operation Haditha came back a few days later, going on Matador. A month later, going on spear, you know, and then there was another operation shortly thereafter. Um, what I want to say that there was two more operations down in Haditha after that. I think there was um, sword, and then um, and there was quick strike, which is kind of towards we, the end. And quick strike was a reaction to the 325 Lima companies or 325 snipers who were uh, found and killed. Uh, by insurgents, and then their bodies dumped into the Euphrates River. Yeah, I let remember me, that too, yeah. Let me go uh, a little more chronologically here. So we talked about the suicide, the triple suicide bombing in April up in Camp Gannon. And then we the, the start of Matador is on May 8th, which happened to be Mother's Day. Yep. So uh, the, the whole plan for Matador is to get across the river into that area called Romana and flush out or flush out this uh, supposed uh, safe haven for terrorist insurgents. Uh, the linchpin for that whole thing is a pontoon bridge that the army, an army bridging company is, is bringing with all their massive trucks and vehicles and everything to set up. It's supposed to set it up at, you know, oh, dark 30 and by, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, they're supposed to be crossing the river. And it did not work out at all that way. <laughs> so no. There were a lot of problems. A truck flipped. The bank was too steep. I won't go into it. Uh, the, the, by the way, the army does not come out well <laughs> in this whole operation. That, that just, just it happens like one thing after another. Yep. So uh, while they're waiting by the river, waiting for this bridge to be built, essentially the, the battalion is static and they start to receive fire from a town essentially in their rear called New Ubaidi. Um, and they, first they get some pop shots, then a few other, and then they get an actual um, a mortar fire. So that's when uh, they decide to do a hasty assault. And that's where Matt uh, enters the picture pretty big time. Yeah, so Arch, uh, so Arch, you know, third platoon, I was, or no, I'm second platoon. Second platoon pushes out to the far what northern edge of the city, um, and we're we're basically in the middle of a road, and you just start hearing the pop shots coming off the side of the tracks, and it's just like oh fuck, um, you know, all of a sudden the doors to the M tracks hit uh, start lowering, and I'm the first guy, and it's just like, all right, <laughs> it's either get killed in the track or get killed and exiting the track exit the track hit a ditch um you know start providing suppressive fire mind you that ditch is filled with uh feces and shit all all of the above it was it was a shit filled ditch and 
RPGs just going straight overhead. A couple of us had RPGs literally going a foot over our head. Um, then we start moving into the city, and I want to say we only pushed about a block into the city. Um, you know, I go to, you know, I start clearing house to house uh, with with our squad, and then I move up to the end of the block to support the other machine gunner that's up there. We had two, mach- uh, we had one machine gun, a 240 up at the end. I'm a 249 gunner at the time. I go up there. All of a sudden, I hear. Um, I hear a firefight break out right behind me, and it was Larry Philippon, uh, Emmanuel Nelson, Doc Alfaro, and Travis Kern. And Philippon kicked open the door, got shot and killed as soon as he entered the door. Nelson reached out, tried grabbing him, got took a bullet through the arm. Uh, Doc Alfaro grabbed Nelson to pull him out of the doorway. He took shrapnel to the leg, and then Kern was behind a car, and a bullet came right through, hit Kern in the leg, um, you know, and all he could see was bone popping out of his leg. Oh, Corporal, Borch, Corporal Borch, who was a squad leader at the time, grabbed Kern, brought, uh, and me and Kern brought him over to me. And then I'm getting a tourniquet on Kern's leg, and me and Busky are getting Kern, is getting Kern over to a casualty collection point. Um, you know, it was, uh, it you know, when we first took contact outside the city, and the fire ceased, me, Philippon, Kern, Nelson, Rainey, Lockwood, all of us. We were all just kind of smiling like, holy shit, we just went through our first firefight and we came out of it alive. And then that happened and it was the most sobering experience ever. Um, You know, carrying Philippon's body in a tarp, not a body bag, a tarp and seeing, you know, half his face there, you know, bullets riddled down his body, bloodied and just carrying him you know, to the casualty collection point, you know, it's, it's an image you'll never forget. Um, but we weren't done, you know, we get, we go to the other side of the block and we have to clear back, uh, because the, that, that other block hadn't been cleared. So now we're just clearing. And and here's the problem. We couldn't use frags on houses because we got information that there were friendlies inside houses too. So we're just at that point kicking down doors you know, who's to say if Philippon would still be alive if we were able to throw fragmentation grenades in there, you know? Yeah, what was well, the... Let me add... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, what was, like, the feeling among the <clears throat> the Marines that were there after those guys were, you know, injured and killed when you have to keep going, you know, to the next building over? Like, well, this isn't... You know, we don't stop. We got to keep going. Did it feel... I feel like you, if you're going if you're going from building to building and nothing every time it's nothing or almost every time it's nothing you start to get a little bit of complacency with how you like go into a room or something like that. Did it feel like you guys were getting complacent at all and then that like tightened you back up and then no. you know how, what was the vibe? Mm-mm. We were all on edge. Um for sure. Like, especially after, you know, we suffered those casualties, we were we were amped up. We actually got the individuals we didn't kill them uh but we captured the individuals who killed and wounded our marines um and we kept clearing we kept clearing back uh to the roadway uh we suffered one more uh wounded whenever we got to the last house um i won't go into the specifics actually you know what i will um Lockwood had a shotgun slung on his back and he went to go he, he went to go handcuff or zip tie a guy uh, that we we suspected of being an insurgent whenever he was reaching down and um, whenever he was kneeling down the shotgun slid trigger guard uh, got caught on the zip ties and it, mind you prior to him taking this shotgun he was told it was clear so Whenever he uh, kneeled down, shotgun went off, blew half the guy's arm off, and took two of uh, Lockwood's toes. Oh, so Jesus. That was our our last casualty of the day. Um, wow. So that, that put another guy in our squad out of the fight. Um, 
you know, and we were given we were given the option, hey, you guys can either stay a four man squad and we'll put engineers with you to to help back you up and support you, mm -hmm. or we're breaking we were there was only four of us in that squad left at that point, me, Borch, Rainey, Gale. Um, so we were we were given that option. Either you guys are getting broken up into the rest of the platoon or you guys are going to get an engineer squad to support you guys. And we chose to take an engineer uh, engineer team, I'm sorry. Um, and we continued the rest of the operation um, like that. How did that uh, feel? How did that make you think about your prospects for the rest of the deployment when there's only four of you left from your squad? So, you know, at this moment. Um, honestly, at the time, we weren't thinking about it. We were, we were just thinking, what the fuck? Like it, it was more of a what the fuck moment. Mm -hmm. We just got thrown through the ringer. You know, our whole squad or half our squad got taken out of the fight. Uh, how are we going to continue going on? And and we did, you know, at that point it was on and we just wanted to continue, continue pushing through the operation. It wasn't until we got into the track, you know, we we're all just sat there, you know, pretty solemn. Uh, considering what we just went through, we had uh, there were some snipers that were in the track with us, uh, and you know, Copal Uridia and I just kind of looked at each other, and I was like, Philippon didn't make it, you know, and I just started crying, you know, what else was I to do? From that mm -hmm. point, I uh, fell asleep. Uh, the adrenaline dump, you know, it finally drained me, um, and then we got woken up, had to go sit up or uh, watch over from the edge of the city. And then that night, you know, we dug uh, fighting holes, uh, just skirmisher positions, and we crashed for the night. And then the next day is whenever we finally pushed across uh, the Euphrates River and cleared uh, north of the Euphrates. Was there any issues with, like, mental health or anything within the guys that are remaining, you know, in the unit? There's, you guys are taking casualties, like, constantly, you know, between suicide bombers, between, you know, door-to-door -door so, fighting, you know, like... So I guess one thing I'll say is if you look at the numbers, like that entire deployment, we own that the battalion only took three KIA. Mm -hmm. That's pretty remarkable given, given the circumstances. Um, there were quite a few wounded, uh, 325 Lima company had it much harder than we did. Yeah. They, let me, let me interject on that. So, uh, in that operation, uh, operation Matador, at the same time that that Matt and his squad are going through what he just described, just to the north of them, a few blocks, uh, the Lima Company of three two five is they having a very, guys. a very similar experience where they they run into the last house on the block, and there's a hidden machine machine gun crew in the house, and it just turns it just turns awful. They lose two guys there, uh, but. But the same, basically the the enemy, which were the foreign fighters, had done a little mini Fallujah, digging themselves into these to these homes. Uh, and in that case, uh, the Lima Company guys, they were dug in under a stairwell, using armor piercing uh, machine gun rounds, seven six two machine gun rounds with the black tip, so they would just punch right through cinder block and, and concrete even. So extremely deadly, and these Marines are going into these houses not knowing what's on the other side of the door. And in the, some of the cases, they go straight into the, the fire. Um, and at the same time, there's a huge air effort. Uh, and you being a JTAC um, should appreciate this, but there's a huge air effort to pin down and and identify fleeing enemy as they flee out of New Ubedi, uh, trying to cross the river on boats, uh, and they're getting schwacked by F-18s and helicopters. So there's kind of a combined arms uh, effort all around that that town. It's more than a town. It's, I would call it a city of New Ubedi. But that's all just a sideshow for the operation. It was almost like they stumbled into that. They're mm -hmm. still trying to cross the river. So anyway, I'm just trying to describe the intensity of that uh, that first day of that operation. And that's, um, that's May eighth. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's where Brian Stan, where he, you know, got in some intense firefights. Yeah, that was and that's a little... where he was. 
and he was awarded a, a silver star. Silver star. The little further down the river at a blocking position, but you're 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 correct. The same same day they start this uh, this you know heavy action at the the blocking position by the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a few miles uh, up river. Um, yeah, very heavy action. Fi- basically, finding that the the enemy has is willing in certain places willing to stand and fight. In other places, when they finally cross the river the next day, they find that Ramana is pretty much vacant of mm-hmm. of any enemy fighters. There's a lot of people like Matt described what, that you know won't talk to him. Um, so anyway, that that's Matador. Uh, I don't I don't know. If, there's so much to go. I don't know how much we want to dwell on certain things. Uh, that Operation Matador was uh, a mixed success in that they, they couldn't really find the, the safe haven or the, you know, they'd left, they, they'd gotten wind and they, they beat feet and gone somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he talked about other operations down the pike after that. Uh, and then a month later is operation spear, which is, uh, in another city on the, the, the near side of the river called Caraba. Caraba. Yep. And, and that's where Matt figures in, Again, and that's where the the, the hostages that he, they found were, that was part of that. Go ahead, Matt. No, I mean, uh, well, I kind of de- described, you know, I would say Matador was probably the most kinetic of them. Uh, Spear was kinetic more for first platoon uh, because uh, Pim, his whole squad, uh, they go into a house. Uh, before they go into a house, there's an old man outside saying, oh, no enemy, friendly, friendly, friendly. Go into the house to clear it. All of a sudden, a grenade comes down the stairwell, uh, kills Crumpler, uh, two of the Marines had AT-4s on their back, uh, Jackson, and shoot. I can't think of his name now. Uh, Well, the AT-4s go off on their back, and, you know, basically, Basically, the overpressure just blows the rest of the squad out of the house. Um, the, the rocket fired off through the roof. Yep. They can see uh, it. From- yeah, and then the that insurgent ran back up the stairs, and as he was coming up the stairs, he was going to jump off the roof, and that's whenever Turco took a shot and uh, shot him in the head. That's great. I mean, I guess up through the roof is way better than it pointing down at the ground. You know, oh yeah, that would have been disastrous. Even more so. That's crazy though. So someone rolled a grenade down the stairs and it killed a guy and yep. it set off two AT fours. Yep. And Damn. then that and then that insurgent just ran down the stairs, picked up uh picked up Crumpler's weapon and started shooting at the Marines. Uh, a couple of the Marines got hit in the back, or one of the Marines got hit in the back, but you know the rest of the squad, you know. They suffered some minor injuries, but nothing, nothing major. Yeah. Um, they just opened so, up on them then. Uh, well, that's whenever the, they, they were so, I, I guess I, I, I don't want to speak out of place for them, I guess, because they got blown out of the house. Um, the guy just ran back up the stairs and like I said, he, he was going to jump off the rooftop oh, and yeah. that's whenever he, he was killed. Damn, man. So that's uh, crazy. Another part of Operation Spear was at the time, if, if you may may recall. Remember, this is early 2005. Well, by Spear, it's pretty much mid 2005. June. There was a, there was June a, 17th. Yep, there was a great debate uh, about. Well, is are there really foreign fighters coming in? Are there? You know how how prominent is the AQI presence, the the Al Qaeda presence in Iraq? Um, is Syria helping them? There were all these kind of, you know, overarching questions. And a lot of the media were skeptical, to say the least, that no, no, no. These are these insurgents are local Iraqis, mostly the the foreign fighter threat is overstated. I'm, I'm saying what the media was saying at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so Operation Spear really drove a nail through the heart of that argument because they found these. Like, like he was talking about uh, and Sudanese, they, they, these training centers, the VBID factories, um, whole stacks of weapons, the the hostages. 
it was it was clearly a way station a processing processing center they found records of you know and passports of the foreign fighters that were coming through that were flowing through the area so, so i'll add ahead. to that so uh, in that in that bbid factory slash ta uh hostage taken situation we found a buttload of information uh, you know hard drives records sops we found all sorts of stuff in there that got sent up to, uh, to battalion battalion sent it up and, and then uh after after the operation um i want to say about four or five days later you know we had a guy i'm assuming he was cia or something like that but he came out to to talk to us uh and he was like hey i don't know if anybody told you guys but that information you found has already killed at least 14 people around the world like there, like 14 terrorists uh 14 individuals in terror cells from around the world that information is already getting put into effect and it was just like Okay. You know, it kind of put everything in perspective of what we were dealing with, because I, I'll tell you how sophisticated some of these enemy fighters were. And, I, you know, we were told, hey, these are Chechen, uh, Chechen fighters that were going up against some of them. Um, they were shooting through loopholes um, that were maybe two inches uh, in width and that were about six inches tall. You know, I remember uh, sitting on a rooftop with gale lockwood and rainy and we have no cover in front of us and next thing you know we just have sniper rounds coming straight by our heads you know just the crack next to your ear and you're just like holy fuck like <laughs> that's always fun right when's you know and, and it's like there's nothing you could do you you tell you you call up and say hey we need to find a better position we have no cover here and we're being told hey stay in place and it's just like fuck what do you do now mm -hmm. uh, and all you're doing is you're waiting to push forward because it was just a major clearing operation and and everybody has has to bound up you know at some point in time and we i, I want to say at that point you know from my recollection is we had already hit our our limited advance for that particular area before we could start moving forward now when you guys are doing these clearing operations or you're working on your way across the river and stuff like that. Are you clearing and then clearing and then leaving like a remain behind element, like setting up a, a patrol base or anything, or is it clearing no. and then leaving? And then is, is that we're, kind of, doesn't that kind of defeat push, the purpose? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to speak specifics on that because like, I was just a Lance Corporal at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know what really went into it. Um, but we did have a follow on element. We did have people behind us that were coming in tow in trace, you know, providing us the security from behind. Um, but yeah, all we were, all we were really doing was just pushing forward. And then afterwards we would, we would pull out of the city and go back to Alkaim. There was no, there was no firm base set up. There was no nothing set up. Uh, I, I don't want to say, it, you know, really kind of, the beginning of Ajax's book where it kind of describes what the awakening is. It wasn't until the awakening occurred that you really started, you know, seeing a lot of the local, the local populace standing up for themselves. And then the Marines are living more out into the towns. Um, and, and kind of whenever I was in 2008, you know, you had Marines staying out in town at the IP stations and stuff like that. That's whenever, mm -hmm. That's everything that everything that we did there led up to what is now known as the awakening. Yeah, let me let me try to uh, lay the groundwork on that. So, one of the things that that led me to this story was that in 2005, the coalition was still struggling with how, how do we even you know handle this mm -hmm. and and making a lot of mistakes. Did not enough troops. You know, not enough emphasis in certain areas. So I, I call it the dark days. 3-2 deployed into probably, you know, the worst or one of the worst areas in the right in the heart of the dark days. But what was happening was a, a kind of a consecutive, you know, battalion by battalion, effort by effort, operation by operation, 
making slow progress. And they were building, you know, first there was 3.7, then there was 1.7, then 3.2 comes, 3.6 comes after them. So there's this campaign in Onbar where the Marines slowly make progress. And this was kind of a turning point in 2005. At the beginning, they were fighting these kind of battles. Towards the end, this tribe, this Aldu Mahal tribe, basically turns. Now, that had more to do with India Company and what was going on in Huseba. And there's a whole aspect of that that Matt wasn't really part of. But that's there was the the two sides, the very kinetic side, and then there's this kind of tribal engagement side of three twos battle in in Al Qaim that merged together and really reach a pivot point where the whole the future starts to change. Uh, when they came back, a lot of them didn't even know, you know, what had happened. <laughs> there were, you know, they 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 knew it was a bad deployment. There were, you know, they lost friends, guys got hurt. Um, it was kind of confusing, uh, and they didn't find out till much later. Some of them, you know, this book as it comes out is going to be a revelation for many that they really made a big difference and turned that that pivot point or the hinge point started when three two was there, and within a year, Al Qaim, the district of Al Qaim, was essentially pacified. It was the first district that really turned the corner and it was an awakening before the awakening the, mm-hmm. the big awakening that everybody remembers is in Ramadi there's a lot of units that that have you know great stories and, and a lot of books have been written about them but that what attracted me to this story was it was untold unrecognized and it was a turning point that was really done on on the backs of grunts you know lance corporals just like matt going through the doors, you know, facing all kinds of dangers and, and making a difference. Good times, man. Uh, (laughs) You know, boots on the ground out there, just grinding away at it slowly, but surely, you know, changing the landscape. When you, when you were leaving, did you feel like, did what did you feel about the deployment? You know, when you were on your way out of the country before you got home to the United States and you know, all that, how did it feel when you were like, dude, it's over, you know, was it worth it? Was it, did you have questions in your mind or anything? So I'll tell you a funny part of that. Um, oh, to kind of answer the question, we just wanted to get home. Yeah. Like whenever, whenever three, six showed up, we were like, okay, like, it's time to go. Um, and and we were just relieved. Like it was sad that we lost people, obviously, like, you know, it was just, you know, it was a shitty feeling, uh, that you were, you weren't going home with the same people that you went there with. Um, it was a relief that we're alive. Uh, but a funny part, I remember sitting, I, I was sitting at me and our platoon sergeant, Tim Hansen. He's still a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a master guns. Um, it was me, Tim Hansen. I want to say Rainey or Dowds might have been the, in, in there as well. We were all playing like Madden on on uh, Hansen's, Tim's uh, Xbox. Our, our platoon commander, Nate Smith, comes in and he's like, hey, I just wanted to kind of let you know uh, there may be a briefing about us going to respond to Hurricane Katrina um, since we're on our way back. So instead of going back home, then going on leave, we're going to be flying straight to Louisiana to go handle Katrina uh, and the effort over there. And I remember straight looking at at Nate, Nate Smith, uh, Lieutenant Smith at the time, and just being like, well, sir, I can tell you right now, there's going to be more dead people over there than what we just killed over here. Because, I mean, how could they think of sending a battle-hardened unit 
from sure. a combat zone over to humanitarian effort. And because we were watching the news. We saw the rioting and the looting and all that shit going on. It's like, all right, well, I guess everybody's going to be getting their CONUS kill or some shit like that. <laughs> but, I mean, they obviously they uh, they that didn't happen. Yeah, good. I mean, that would have been crazy for sure. That would have that would have been a horrible idea. Does it make you, you know, with a hard deployment where you're losing guys, you guys are getting injured, you're, you know, you're getting into some real fighting. You know, mm-hmm. stuff that you would see in like the movies. Does it make you look at like how Hollywood depicts the military and be like, "Man, you know, cuz you see guys in movies and these military movies and stuff and a buddy gets killed and it's just like you obviously can't really replicate what that's, you know, actually like in a movie like it is in a war zone. Does it make you look at those kind of movies differently? No, uh, I recognize them for what they are, the pure entertainment. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, there was a point I, I remember we talked about, you know, me going through JFO school and I remember me and a friend sitting in his room watching True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger on the Harrier and what they oh, had yeah. in LMAV or some shit like that. <laughs> and it was just like that rocket can't go to that to that plane. Like mm-hmm. they don't they don't go together. And it's like this is fucking stupid. But it's like this is so uh, fake. <laughs> but uh, I just I recognize entertainment for entertainment. I enjoy it for what it is. Um, you know, I, I would say the most realistic uh, war films or series out there, Band of Brothers and, and, and the Pacific, you know, I I would even say uh, the Pacific is underrated. It is. It is. You know, I, I honestly still enjoy Band of Brothers a lot more just because it covers the leadership aspects of things. Mm-hmm. And I really I really like I've read Major Dick Winter's book um, and it's phenomenal and i really enjoyed watching easy company but you're right the pacific you know that that is a go-to uh even generation kill i I would say generation kill is a really good depiction of the 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 minds of modern day marines you know you have every type of marine that you can imagine in there it's hilarious i remember when that movie came out or when the miniseries came out and uh it was you know everybody was talking about it. everyone was like excited for it like this is gonna be awesome this is like the first you know really good iraq i think there was like a show called like over there on tv for a little while and there was like a really bad like ramadi or haditha dam movie or something like that but this was like gonna be one of the big you know good uh, first war kind of depictions and the it was B-rated comic- or it was a b-rated movie or something like that i think i know what you're talking about i actually had a friend if it's the same one a friend of mine was like one of the he was he was he depicted the company commander from and it covered the incident in haditha where they went Mm. on that massacre yeah yeah Uh, yeah. and and, uh the guy who depicted the company commander andrew mclaren he was a marine you know he was a corporal in the marine corps and he got out and he got into some hollywood stuff here and there but yeah uh, it was i would say it was uh a really bad B-rated movie. <laughs> yeah, for sure, a hundred percent was. But when when Generation Kill was coming out, I remember the first day they did the screening, the Commandant and the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps were like, "That's not how Marines act," because of like the first Bullshit. ten minutes, <laughs> the first ten minutes when they're talking about, they're like looking at that girl's photo, like oh, I would look, you know, I would sniff to see where that came from, you know. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, and everyone, all the like actual like Marines, you know, like enlisted guys and stuff like that, were like, "That's spot on. This movie is or this show is great." You know, the the calm calls, everything about it was great. Um, my my wife, she watched that with me. She's like, I was laughing my ass off during the whole thing. My wife looked at me and she was like, "You're not like that." Yeah. What the fuck is she, wrong with you? <laughs> you know, you, people get you. It's it's such a different environment. Um, yeah. When you're around, not just like other Marines, but these are your, especially when it's your unit and your friends and stuff like that. You're closer than family because you live together, you work together, you suffer together, and stuff. And and usually there's always a couple weirdos within the unit that take kind of like comedy to the edge. And that really kind of brings a weird vibe to conversations, to, you know, everything about it. It's just funny. It's mm-hmm. just like a different environment that you couldn't, 
you can't replicate in the real world. People wouldn't like it. I don't know how much of it was like that in uh, the Air Force, uh, Ajax. Oh, it was uh, kind of similar. Don't wanna, you don't want to go into my Air Force days. It's nothing <laughs> like that. Um, there's an old joke about the Air Force that, that uh, I've heard people use against me all the time. Uh, it's that little uh, comic strip. It's like there's an army guy in a trench and he goes, Oh, it's raining. It sucks. And then there's like a Marine, a special forces guy. And, Oh, wow. I, I wish this would suck some more. And then the Marine goes, yeah, I can't wait. We wanted more suck. And then the air force guy goes, ah, no cable. This sucks. Yeah, you for know, sure. Right. His feet up in the B in the BOQ. But there's a lot of truth to that, except that post nine 11. So, uh, I will say that every service, our, you know, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, believe it or not, uh, after 9-11, there were, there were uh, segments that were, you know, deploying constantly. So mm -hmm. uh, in the Air Force, uh, the EOD, um, security forces, uh, the uh, EW guys, uh, electronic warfare guys ended up being the uh, ones that managed the uh, programs for jamming IEDs. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but um, you know, there's the EW Air Force EW guys, officers and enlisted that were out there in Iraq and Afghanistan patrolling roads and teaching army and, and I guess, maybe marine units how to uh how to run their systems so they wouldn't get blown up but they were just at risk as, as everybody else well and There's i some... mean you include those special tactics guys are out there yep. you know yep. doing their crazy stuff i mean yeah definitely air force had an impact and i think it's funny you, you brought up the coast guard and i think a lot of people kind of right off the coast guard for a long time and then that video came out of that dude jumping on the sub and beating on the door to like like open up you know like when they were doing that narco you guys know what i'm talking about where they took down those uh -oh. narcos off the coast oh mm -hmm. you guys haven't seen that it was like viral oh it's a it's a coasty yeah he's they are there's a, a drug a sub there's a drug sub cruising and they pull up next to it and two of them jump over on it and run up to the hatch and start beating on it yeah. until they open it up and then you know they got the guns out and everything like that but it's like Oh, the Coast Guard dudes are out here taking down drug subs. Like those dudes are legit. You know, it's not just uh chilling by I'll, the beach. I'll well, tell you what, the Coast Guard guys, they're fucking badass. Like like think of it like this. Like I I know a lot of guys gave the Marine Corps shit and the Marine Corps sniper shit uh a few years back whenever they went to the international sniper competition and came oh, in yeah. like ninth place or something like that. Well, let me tell you something. Those Coast Guard guys they get to stay in the same unit and get to work together for like for an entire career. Like they can be, be with the same people for an entire career and know mm -hmm. each other and train together and do everything together. Like, whereas like you have guys from the schoolhouse and you know, they're only together for a few years, you know, would... and, and, and let's be real, like, you know, kind of like what I, I, I talk about on my podcast, Marine Corps, we, we don't shoot enough. We don't shoot guns as nearly as much as we should. We're not mm. as proficient as we should be. I would a hundred percent. Like if my kid asked if he should join like the coast guard or the Navy, I would say coast guard over the Navy. Oh, fuck. You, yeah. You know, like I, oh, yeah. I've worked with the Navy and a lot of them. I just don't like it. Just, it's just how it is. It's that service. I don't know. My two deployments on the same ship may not have been, uh, may not have helped, but, um, but the Coast Guard, there's a lot of opportunities there that people don't even realize. And you can stay stateside and do cool stuff. And I don't know. I don't think it's a bad idea. And we actually worked with one of the Coast Guard. I don't know what they're called, but like they're special operations guys. One of them was out in Bahrain with us. Or no, not Bahrain, Kuwait with us and doing close air support. Like we were doing, uh, he, wasn't a yeah. he wasn't a JTAC, but I think he was a JFO. And I was like, Hell what? Yeah. I'm like, why do you guys need a JTAC? <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, there were. There were Coast Guard in, in Iraq. Uh, they were associated yeah. with the, the the customs, the you know training the Iraqis on how to do customs, and of course Iraq is full of smugglers. A lot of them armed smugglers. A lot you know, so it can get violent. So yeah, I think a, I think a Coast Guard unit actually was just in the news like last week or maybe a couple weeks ago. They 
stopped a big shipment of drugs in like Yemen, off yep. the coast of Yemen or something like that. And everybody's like, why is the Coast Guard off the coast of Yemen? And yeah. well, you know, that's what happened. So it, all of the services that towards the end of the book, I, I kind of focus on this. And I think one of the closing lines, I think, is, uh, you know, the men and women from all services that, uh, you know, deployed again, again and again. Um, we, we have to remember that. And that's one of the motivations for writing the book. You know, in some ways, the, the story of 3-2 and Al-Qaim is, is emblematic of many other units, Army and Marines, you know, combat units that, mm-hmm. that served forgotten. and fought there and were, for, yeah, and were forgotten. So it's kind of, in a way, you know, every battalion story, uh, except for this pivotal place, pivotal time aspect. Uh, but there's a lot of universality to it. Uh, so yeah, it's just my way of honoring these, these young, they were young guys. So what I, I was able to deploy, uh, in and out of Iraq in 2004 and five. And I just remember seeing some, some of the, the just great young people that were, that were, uh, doing amazing things. And then in 2007, I deployed attached to the army and what was called a, um, in lieu of tasking, an ILO tasking, where they would take chunks of of uh, people from the Navy uh, and, or from the Air Force, and then they would augment the Army or the Marines. Hmm. Um, so, a- again, just super impressed with the young soldiers that I encountered. Uh, it was in a really, a really bad spot uh, called the Triangle of Death south of Baghdad. Um, so... You know, I was more of a an observer. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I was warned never to go outside the wire. That I would be Article 15 if I if I ever got caught outside the wire. Strange. That's funny. Of course, I was a, an air Force officer, an intelligence officer. Uh, kind of had no business doing it, but but of course, obviously, I tried. <laughs> as soon as I got there, I would try. And I, I did get out a couple of times. Everybody wants to, right? Nobody wants to like be right. in country an entire deployment and be like, yeah, I never left the base. Like that was lame, <laughs> which yeah. was, which was like really my first deployment to Iraq. I didn't, the only time I left the base was to get on a helicopter to fly over to another base, you know, cause I was a TQ and then I was a mechanic at the time. So it was a completely different world for me. So I was in TQ and then went over to Al Assad to go get like, like, uh, my eyes checked and stuff for my lap move, actually for my reenlistment, my lap move to 0861. But yeah, man, it's, um, it's definitely, you know, 20 years of war. There's tons of stories out there. And that's why I think the podcast is really great. And you know, your, your podcast and, you know, writing books and everything is, there's so many like stories of just everyday people doing like crazy stuff. And people don't even realize, you know, that these dudes are walking amongst them that have experienced some like just, I don't know, just some once in a lifetime kind of good and bad. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely some fucked up shit that's happened. There's good stuff and there's bad stuff to it all. But oh, absolutely. You know, so I think it's great. I guarantee most people would say I wouldn't trade those experiences for the world. Well, you know, I just and I keep bringing this up, but I uh, or I was talking about it last night. I did a live stream with another podcast, the uh, Choices Not Chances podcast. Um, I. I was talking there about how I released this recent video with my buddy, Michael Hanthorne talking about doing mortuary affairs during Fallujah. You know, I put his voice over from the podcast over some footage from Fallujah. And that's the thing at the end of the video is he says that, you know, and I ask him, I'm like, you know, how, how many bodies did you guys clean up in that month and a half? And it was 600 over 600. Yeah. And then it Jeez. was like, I remember I, I listened to that one this week and, and then, yeah. Like, and then I asked fuck. It's crazy. And it was it and, and the thing was the, the thing that really surprised me, it wasn't obviously it wasn't friendly. He was picking up six hundred enemy bodies. Yeah. And it's you know, it's just like parts how do you deal with that. Skeletons. Yeah. You know, he mentioned how like some of them had been out there so long the dogs had been eating them and now they're just basically skeletons left. But I was like, you know, if you came back in or if they asked you to go do that again, would you? And he was like, Yeah. You know, because of the experience that I got to be with my friends and, you know, it was fucked up, but you got to hang with the homies and go on this crazy adventure kind of deal. And it's, you know, it's mind blowing. And that's average people can't really understand that. And I've asked so many people that like, why would you want to go back? You know, you're talking about 
getting in a country and trying to go outside the wire. You know, everybody wants to get out. No one wants to stay on base. Everybody wants to go see what the war is all about. And people mm-hmm. that have never been in the military can't really understand that. And the only thing I ever equated to, I'm like, look, it's like it's like being on a football team for 10 years, but you only get to go to practice. You don't ever get to go to the game. You watch the game on TV and that's it. You know, and you guys want to go and get in the game, you know, for better or worse. And, and you know, I guess one of the, the greatest aspects of it is you will – like those people that you went over there with, they're friends for the rest of your life. Like uh, I was telling Ajax, I was like, I talked to Rooks this week. I talked to to Kern this week. I talked to Rainey this week. Uh, you know, shoot, I talked to Scott Holmes or Shane Holmes today. You know, he was one of our assault men. Like he he was he he messaged me. He was like. Hey, dude, I just listened to your podcast, you know, or I watch your YouTube video that you put out uh, about the book. He's like, I'm buying a copy. And it's like he's like, my family has really no idea of what I went through over there. And I think this is a good, uh, good way to introduce them to what I went through whenever I was over there. And yeah, it's let, like, let me uh, let me talk about that a little bit. So many of the guys that I ended up talking with. um have shared exactly that sentiment that Matt just said. It's like a, a, a way of, I don't really want to call it closure, but um, a way of engaging or dealing with what they experienced. Because many of them had not talked about it to anybody, mm-hmm. you know, particularly, their, particularly their families. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I just talked to somebody the other day. He goes, oh, is it? is everything the way I said it in the book? And I go, yeah, that, that, I'm telling you, you know, it's exactly the way you wanted it. And he goes, yeah, I'm just a little nervous because my, my friends and my family have never read this about me. They don't know. They don't know what we really went through and what I did. And uh, so it's a way of engaging it and, and, and accepting it and acknowledging it and then move, you know, move, moving on. So that's not really closure in my book, but uh for some, I would I would say about eighty five percent, maybe even ninety percent of the guys that I interviewed or or engaged with online are super well, you know they're doing really well and they're successful and they're moving forward with their lives and they got families and and great careers. You know, there's a lot of them that are doing that. There's about ten to fifteen percent that are still struggling, mm-hmm. uh, that are that are. Um, you know, first of all, they lost some of them that got out, you know, soon after that deployment or maybe, you know, a couple of deployments later. They didn't make a career out of it like Matt did. Um, you know, they get out and then they have to deal with, well, now I'm just, uh, you know, the the contractor guy making homes or the mechanic or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, working at, at someplace and, and nobody knows anything about them and they, they don't have that camaraderie anymore so those those warrior circles like matt was just talking about become extremely important to them which is a great a great healing mechanism and also i'll I'll say this i'll say this about that that aspect uh the guys like we had a couple guys in the platoon they got out legitimately a month after we got back from deployment like literally went to seps and taps and then a few weeks later they were out of the marine corps and those guys suffered the hardest. I bet. Uh, and I'm not going to name names. One of them is a, is a very close friend of mine. And I found myself over at his house just about every weekend, you know, just trying to just trying to help where I could, mm-hmm. you know, driving eight hours to his house every week. And, you know, I didn't give a shit about Liberty Limits or anything like that. I wanted to take care of my friend. Um, and there was one point where he was in a, a mental hospital for about a week and I tried, I, you know, I even talked to him while he was there, you know, and I, I told him, I was like, I'll be there this weekend, got there that weekend. He had no recollection that I had talked to him throughout the week. Um, like there was, you know, that's what some of these guys suffered. That's what some of these guys sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it, it becomes very real. Um, yeah. I it, mean, getting out of the military already is a, 
it's a weird transition. You know, it'd be, it's like getting out of prison. You're institutionalized. Mm -hmm. You know, you know where to go. Everyone that's on the base is all part of this, you know, one organization, their structure. You can tell who people are by their, their uniform or their rank or whatever. You know, there's expectations. You're held to a standard and things, things are made out to be important. You know, there's just all well, a of that a sense of mission. And then sense you get out and, and no, yeah, you get out and no one gives a fuck. And it's not that they should give a fuck about your service, but I'm saying no one gives, you can go to the grocery store looking like a slob and no one's going to say anything cool, whatever, you know, that's your right to do it or whatever. But I think a lot of guys hate the military or dislike the military until they get out and they realize how actually good it was because people were held to kind of a standard. And that's not something obviously you can replicate in the civilian world, but it is what no. it is. And when you're leaving this great group of buddies of guys that you've worked with and lived with and everything, especially right after deployment, you're, you're talking about guys that have worked and lived with each other for probably over a year at that point. if you include training and done some of the hardest things they've ever done. Mm -hmm. And then a week later you walk out, you know, you drive off the base and all that's behind you now. And now everyone around you cannot relate to you at all, you know, unless you what? have military friends near you. Well, it's like, you know, I was, I, I was talking to a friend last, last week, you know, I went and shot a competition last Saturday uh, with two really good friends of mine, Noah and Carla. And I, I was telling Carla, I was like, you know, I, I was like, as shitty of a match that was, I really enjoyed just hanging around you and Noah. I was like, you know, one of the biggest things I've kind of been struggling with is I haven't, I don't go to work every day and get to see my friends. Like, mm -hmm. you know, being like from the perspective of being on the shooting team, I went to work every single day and every person on that team, even though I was in charge of them, you know, and I knew how to separate work from, you know, personal life, but every single one of them is my friend. And it's, it, it's one of those struggles that I've, I'm having, you know, and, you know, it, it's, it's, and it's okay. You know, it's like, I have, have they were my friends. I don't see them on a daily basis, but I communicate with them. And, you know, I told Carla and Noah, I was like, I'm just glad I got to come and hang out with you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are fucking awesome. And, and you guys, you know, you're helping me in this transition process. And that's what you need when you're transitioning too. is, is, you know, a good friend, good group of friends that you can still contact, you know, uh, some kind of sense of belonging, some kind of sense of like community, um, and my biggest thing is when guys get out, it's like, Hey, find something that drives you, man. You know, it could be whatever it, you can do, whatever you want to do. You know, you have the opportunity now after the military to go be whatever it is you ever wanted to be, you know, after the military, you, you, you get, use your GI bill, use the benefits that, that have been afforded to you. You know, you can get paid to go to school, to learn whatever it is you want to learn. And, um, I think guys lose sight of that when they get out and they just live in that world of depression and stuff. And I think, you know, doing these podcasts and writing books and stuff like that, a lot of guys, I've had a lot of guys reach out to me after a podcast and be like, dude, thought about so much stuff that just kind of flood flooding my memory of things that I hadn't thought about in forever just because of the conversation and everything. And I'm like, that's the therapy, man. You know, that's it. That's what you really need. That's what a lot of guys really need. And it takes either them opening up and talking about stuff or someone reaching out to a friend and being like, Hey man, how's it been? How you been? It's been a long time. Remember that time we did blah, blah, blah. Remember that party in the bear, you know, like keeping the connections there. Um, I don't know. That's what's important, but let me, uh, let me talk a little bit more about uh, cause the, at the end of the book is the, the last chapter is called the struggle and, and addresses a lot of this. Uh, and I want to read a little passage from one of the Marines about it. But um, the other part of this is that, and there are many parts of the book that guys like Matt have, have helped me, you know, their perceptions and their experiences have helped add layers of feeling to it. And I think I told Matt this the other day that at the beginning, when I started the book, it was, you know, I just thought it was going to be a straightforward, you know, here's what happened. These are the people involved, you know, and it'd be a pretty straightforward story. Uh, and because of Matt and others uh, that that opened up to me and shared their experiences and their emotions, I started realizing how many layers of 
of feeling that that's really the story it was what these personal stories and and that changed the nature of the book and also mm-hmm. makes it a deeper richer and longer book <laughs> but um so it's it's more than just the military history part it's really the the depth and soul of of these warriors that that went to war and came back and are now among us so um in this this chapter the struggle there's a guy uh who was um wounded by a suicide bomber um, during Operation Matador. Uh, his name's uh, Scott uh, Hosliak. Uh, and it, this is what he shares. So, And he had to get out because of his wounds. Um, the big thing is to realize that real men do ask for help. If you think you need help, get help. Talk to someone who will listen. Find something, anything that you feel good doing. I do a lot of hunting and enjoy the outdoors. That works for me. And when it gets tough, I think I'm not going to let them win. I'm not going to give up this many years later. So that's, that's a short little little piece. There's quite a bit of other um, veterans talking to veterans in there about, you know, hey, there's still a lot of, you know, your life is before you. There's you, what you went through made you stronger. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and it also gives you life experience that no one else can no one else will have or not many people can have or and appreciate the stuff that you've seen. You know, it's not all horrific things. You know, you learn stuff about right, other cultures, right. you learn stuff about other people and everything like that. I think it's, um, you know, when I look at it, if someone did four years, they came in when they're 18, they're 22, man, you're not even a third of your life is, is right. not even done. You know, there's so much stuff you can do. There's so many lives to live still like get out and do something. It's just, it kills me when I see someone that, goes down like a uh, rabbit hole of depression and or sucked into like feeling bad about their service or whatever it is. It's like, dude, you got to just, you know, you got to, I don't know. You got to see the sunshine and like see the possibilities and the opportunities that you have that, you know, other, a lot of people would kill to have the GI bill, you know, to be able to yeah. go to college and get paid to go to college and stuff. A lot of people would love to have that. It's just, I don't know. I, I think it's great. I think it's great that people are, I coming around to like talking about issues and stuff like that. I think we're doing a better job of um, getting people's stories out through these podcasts, through the books and stuff. When is your book available? Ajax? Um, it's available now for pre-order. You can go to uh, bastardsandbrothers.com. Um, that's the website that goes along with the book. Uh, it's a lot of uh, ancillary information on there as well. More stories that aren't, didn't get in the book. Are you but, on social uh, media? Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm still learning all that stuff. Um, so Ajax true blood on Facebook, you can find me. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, going to be going to print really soon. So I I can't be sure, but it's, it's almost there and it'll be out. Uh, and if you order now, if you order a hardcover, I will sign it. So nice, nice. And uh, Matt, well, you want to uh, you want to throw your information out about your uh, podcast? Yeah, so I have a podcast that's uh, specifically for three gun practical shooting, competitive shooting, USPSA. It's called the Three G IQ Podcast. You can find it on Instagram at Three G IQ Podcast. Uh, we have a website through Podbead called Three G IQ pcast.com and then we're also on facebook uh which you could just type in three three giq podcast um nice, yeah um yeah no i appreciate this yeah yeah man i really appreciate you guys coming on i really appreciate you guys uh coming on telling the stories talking about you know again these battles and stuff that people don't really realize what happened and stuff you know and uh, just to hear about suicide bombers going off like pretty too too consistently for comfort <laughs> you know yeah. it's just it's just a whole nother it's it, it all these kind of talking to guys like you and stuff that's when i look back at my career and i'm like you know what i really didn't do that much <laughs> you know it wasn't that bad like it, what i went through wasn't too bad you know but it is what it you is you know i i i don't agree with that you know i, well, I think I'm, everything i i think everything that we have all done like you know that was a that was a very short period in my career you know that was the most kinetic part of my career Mm -hmm. you know 2008 whenever i went to ramadi the worst thing that happened to me is i almost got blown up by a suit uh by a uh 
by an IED. You know, yeah. it was a command jet IED. The 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 ins- the insurgents that were out there were two miles away and detonated it. We never caught them. It blew up 15 feet in my, front of my vehicle. That was the worst thing that happened on that deployment. It was Ramadi 2008. Um, you know, the next time, you know, I did anything again was 2017. Whenever I was in the Arabian Peninsula, you know, just out having fun with, uh, with 19 special forces groups. So this, like, I, you know, that, that 2005 was the most kinetic aspect of my career. And I would say it was the, one of the most, you know, other than Sangin, it was one of the most, the biggest hotbeds of the war. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Saying it was a shithole, but it was unfortunately three five, and the you know those other guys took a lot of the brunt of it before we got there. It was definitely not as bad as the situation, but yeah, I, I, I'm I'm totally I'm not I'm not I'm not too serious about it. I don't measure I don't really put my career up against other people's. I think that's a bad idea for anybody because everybody's but, done more than some people and less than other people. So and, and that's what I, that, and that's what I was gonna say. You have some guys and like I remember hearing this, you know, uh, listening to your podcast when I first found it. It was like, like there's always gonna be a guy who's more of a badass than you, who's done mm-hmm. more than you. You know, don't inflate what you've done because there's always going to be somebody bigger than you, but just embrace everything that you did do. Yep. And, 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 and realistically just be happy that you, you got through that time in one yeah. piece. Yeah. Just be proud of your service, you know, no matter what yeah. you did. Cause you don't, a lot of times you don't get to choose, you know, you get told to go yeah. do something and it's, it is what it is, but yeah, really great conversation, guys. Really appreciate it. Really good insight on on the 2005 deployment for 3-2. Uh, everybody out there, you know, you can check me out at Former Action Guys, at Former Action News on Instagram. J. Kramer Graphics is my website. Support the show on Patreon. Go to patreon.com, look up Former Action Guys, and that is it. Thanks, Justin. Hey, thanks. Thanks, guys.